Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or add our RSS feed to your podcatcher of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter or Google+, and please give us feedback. Leave us a review on iTunes to help other people find the show, send us a tweet, send us an email, leave us a message on Google+, or leave a comment on our show notes. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. For details on how to support the show, you can visit our site at pythonpodcast.com. I would also like to thank Hired, a job marketplace for developers, for sponsoring this episode of Podcast.init. Use the link hired.com slash podcast.init to double your signing bonus. Linode is also sponsoring us this week. Check them out at linode.com slash podcast.init and get a $10 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for your next project. We are recording today on November 23rd, 2015, and your hosts as usual are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. Today we are interviewing Sylvain Tenot about Asteroid. Sylvain, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Hello, so my name is Sylvain. I'm, uh, I have been working with Python since uh, for the last uh, 15 years almost, uh, mainly at uh, Logilab, uh, where I'm doing some uh, various client stuff uh, and mostly with Python. So how'd you get introduced to Python? Um, I get introduced to Python, uh, as I said, uh, almost 15 years ago. Uh, at that time, it was uh, Python uh, 152. Uh, at that time, I began my uh, internship at uh, Logilab, and uh, Python was uh, the language of uh, choice there. So I started uh, to learn Python at this occasion. And as an intern, my first uh, open source project was XML diff. It was already um, some things related to manipulating tree. Uh, it was about um, implementing some algorithm to to indicate the difference between two different XML documents. Can you explain what an abstract syntax tree is and why it's a useful language feature? Uh, I can try to do that. Uh, well, an abstract syntax tree is a representation of the source code. Uh, there are actually two different kinds of uh, uh, representation. There are the abstract syntax tree and the parse tree. Parse tree, I acquired it. Um, uh, well, the difference is that uh, Asterix syntax tree doesn't uh, uh, include every element of the uh, source code, like uh, parent or things like that, uh, spaces around uh, operator or stuff like that. So that's why it's it's kind of uh, an higher level. So. In those three, you get uh, a representation of the structure of the source code. Uh, each node of the tree is a, a construct that occurs in the source code, like uh, an assignment. You get uh, uh, child nodes, one for the part which is assigned to, and another for the value which is assigned, uh, etc. So you get uh, a lot of different kinds of nodes for every kind of uh, construction you can have in your source code. It's uh, useful for a uh, different thing, like uh, uh, basically when you want to do almost anything with source code, you don't want to start from the string representation of the source code. So you start by having um, a tokenizer, which feeds a grammar, and from that you usually get uh, this kind of representation, and from that you can do almost uh, uh, what you want with it, uh, like uh, generating bytecodes uh, or some source code, uh, transformed source code, or doing some static analysis like we do in Python. What was your inspiration for creating Asteroid? 
I didn't need really inspiration because I have not started this project from scratch. Uh, when I started with Pylint from which Asteroid uh, come, it, it was in 2003. Uh, and we had a, a need for this kind of tool at Trogy Lab where I wanted to, to check different things on um, Python code. At this time, it was only a PyShaker. And uh, the problem with PyShaker was that it uh, was importing the source code. So I wanted to do something that the doesn't import uh, because when, when you import the source code, for instance, you have to uh, you need to have all the requirements installed on your own computer, and you don't necessarily want to to do that. So uh, I wanted to work on the source code, and at that time uh, there was the um, compiler package in the. Python standard library, so I started from that. Uh, it wasn't, uh, at that time, uh, the, it wasn't named Asteroid, but uh, Logilab A ASTMG. Um, and so it was basically an extension to the compiler module. So that's really not uh, a project that started from scratch. It started from this module, then uh, it was adapted to uh, as a Python evolve. For instance, in Python 2.5, uh, uh, it was the beginning of the exposition of the internal uh, abstract, syntax, abstract syntax tree of Python through the underscore AST module. So at this time, we had to, uh, it's really at this time that Asteroid began to have, I don't know how to do, do that, uh, a kind of mixed AST, which was partially inspired from compiler module and from the uh, internal uh, abstract synthesis provided by Python, which was, of course, different. It was, would be too easy. <laughs> so so um, uh, it then evolved, but uh, in any case, for instance, Asteroid doesn't include its own parser. Uh, at that time, it was either using, uh, depending on the Python version you was uh, using, it was using either the compiler module or the un uh, underscore AST module, but it was providing to the end user compatible uh, representation. Interesting. So what features does Asteroid offer over st Python's standard AST package? And what makes those features important? So, beside the kind of compatibility layer, I, I may say a bit more about that later. But the, this is uh, basically driven. Asteroid is driven by uh, the pilings uh, need. Uh, so, the kind of thing you will find uh, is like. A, uh, some more advanced way to navigate in the tree. Uh, like uh, you see some variable and you want to know uh, which uh, assignments node have uh, affected this variable. Uh, that's kind of name lookup, but uh, quite different. Um, and the, the really main feature is like uh, is a static inference, which base, based on this uh, name resolution is uh, capable of uh, answering questions like uh, what's the value of this variable, and it's based on it's based on uh, simply by anal analyzing the. the static code, that's a big uh, difficulty where there is no actual execution of the code. It try to find uh, what's the tip or even the, the value of uh, identifier or class member, instance member, and so on. Based on, uh, it's implemented using uh, Python generators because of course you may find several uh, solution and uh, so you've got an API, an API where you just ask um, uh, 
infer me every possible values and it will return to you uh, uh, things like uh, classes, uh, instances, uh, list, uh, constant values, uh, and maybe a special kind of object uh, saying that uh, uh, it has uh, reached a path where he couldn't find uh, any answer. So that's really the, the big thing you you've get in, you've got in uh, Asteroid. Just so that I understand, I guess I had thought with a standard AST that's how they worked as well. That that the AST would contain things like when you defined a class, it would detain it would contain the class definition with all of the methods underneath that expressed as method objects with statement object. You know what I mean? Like, I guess I thought it was broken down that way. Yes, it is. So, but you're saying that Asteroid allows you to infer the values. Yes, I do. So you write that uh, in uh, AST, you get some, when you read some Python source code, you will get uh, like a, a node for a function def or class def and a, uh, a note for every assignment there or any uh, method definition inside a class def. And um, so it's quite low level and you, you've got, um, and you don't have anything like, uh, like, uh, uh, give me a, which the, the value of this attribute or this value of uh, the value of this uh, identifier at this point in the code, you basically only have nodes. And the um, in Asteroid, uh, we we have this inference capability, which by jumping from node to node is able to. Uh, get back to you with here are the, the list of uh, value I've been able to find by uh, analyzing the code statically. For instance, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, an identifier which is affected to a function call, then it's able to, uh, it will look up by navigating in the tree uh, what's, this, what's uh, this function. Uh, it may be a function, let's say, that is uh, imported from another module. Uh, then it will uh, get the AST for this uh, module. And uh, it will look at the function and look at, uh, for instance, the, the different values which are re returned by this function. And it will uh, get back to the caller that... Uh, uh, you may, uh, by calling this function, you may get, uh, I don't know, a, a, a list of uh, ints, for instance. I see. I get it now. So basically, Asteroid almost gives you IDE-like functionality in the API where you can say, what is the value here? Now, what is the value here? Now, what is the value here? As opposed to the standard AST features where it's just node soup almost as if you were parsing a, uh, an XML document or something with all the nodes that you have to walk and traverse to get the values. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. And that's quite complicated stuff with, uh, basically you, you, you almost have to rewrite a kind of uh, Python interpreter because you, you've got to uh, understand most of Python construct, like, uh, I don't know, a tuple assignment or a subscription callable protocol, so we have to rebuild this kind of thing. So, of course, we have chosen to not using the interpreter, because using the interpreter would mean that the code would have to be executed. We are not executing the code. We are only partially, almost executing it, but only by small bit, like uh, I'm at this point in the, if the code, and then I, uh, it will uh, provide some API to get every information you can, you would get as a programmer by following the path, reading the function, look at the values which are returned, and things like that. 
Yeah, definitely sounds as though Asteroid would be the preferred way of interacting with the AST when you're trying to infer anything about the mechanics of the program rather than having to do all of the walking of the tree yourself. I'm curious if there are any sort of higher level graph algorithms that you leverage for that capability as opposed to just doing a brute force approach. Yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of thing we need uh, in Python for static analysis. Like, you want to know this kind of thing because you want to check, for instance, uh, uh, that's pretty similar to the things you need in an uh, idea. In, in a static analysis tool like Python, you have similar needs as in uh, ID because you want to know if you are somewhere in your source code, you want to know that this uh, self thing or this uh, am variable uh, is actually some int or some instance of uh, this class. And so you want to, in the case of an uh, ID, you want to know, for instance, provide a completion or things like that to the user. In the case of PyNint, you want to check that it actually has the method that is used or that this method uh, or function has the uh, correct arguments and so on. Or maybe you don't mix uh, string with int and there is an uh, infinity of things you may want to do with uh, this kind of uh, capabilities. And so it sounds like with Asteroid and Pilot, you have at least some capability of doing type inference to determine if you're trying to do an incompatible assignment or access of various typing. And also I'm curious if the recent addition of the typing module to Python 3.5 is going to be a boon to, for your purposes in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are not currently, we, we are not yet uh, capable of uh, uh, um, getting advantages during uh, using type annotation we get in Python uh, 3, but uh, at some point we, we definitely win. And so I know that the Asteroid package is used in PyLint, which is also maintained by Logilab. Uh, how does the AST facilitate static analysis of Python projects in other cases when you have to fall back to doing text parsing? So uh, first, to be clear, Logilab has uh, created PyLint and Asteroid back in 2003. Uh, we have maintained it for the almost from until uh, until now. But there, there are now several people in the boat with us, uh, which are actually doing the, the most of the work. Like uh, uh, there has been some people from Google, which uh, have been involved in uh, Pilot since for for maybe five years now. It, it was the first important contributors we get. For two years now, we have uh, another people which is uh, actively maintaining. Pilot and Asteroid, and we have even have now some new guy uh, which uh, is uh, working particularly on Asteroid because he wants to use it in uh, another project which is named MacroPy, uh, which uh, uh, I don't know well, but attempts to uh, provide macro for Python. So, so we are not the only maintainers now. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, some very active uh, people, and I think that uh, that's very good both for Pine, uh, Pilot and Asteroid, since it's uh, almost uh, never. Uh, both projects have uh, never been uh, so active that they are they are now. So to to get back to the question. Uh, the, um, it provides some nice facilities like uh, 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 high-level representation of the source code. So we already talked a bit about that. Uh, in the case of Python, uh, it's also uh, you, a way to get a, a, f- a compatible representation whatever the Python version. Uh, we used to provide support for something like Python from uh, 
2.1 or 2.2 to 2.6. No, Paint itself is running, uh, and even uh, Asteroid is only running uh, using Python 2.7 because uh, it's a way to have a code which is uh, compatible using both Python 2 and Python 3, but uh, you can still pass some code which is written for uh, all the Python version. So uh, Asteroid provide this uh, compatibility level. And uh, one of the main points is that it's generic to AST is that uh, once you get this representation, you can process it uh, through the well-known uh, design patterns, design pattern, uh, the, I mean, namely, namely the visitor design pattern. So it's something which, I don't know if I have to explain this, but... Uh, we can just add a link to it in the notes. Uh, like, uh, so this is a, a quite easy design pattern, which allows you to do a really different thing, like uh, Pilot is using it uh, for annotating the source code and maybe uh, emitting messages, or you will see a similar thing in compiler if you want to generate uh, 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 some more advanced uh, representation for your source code if you want to to generate binary uh, stuff or things like that. So uh, this is what you can do with an AST, but there are uh, some things like uh, where where you uh, don't have you have lost information in the AST like. Uh, uh, so we indeed have to go back to text parsing. For instance, if you want to, in the case of uh, static analysis, if you want to uh, take a look at what's in the comment, or in comments you, you, you don't have, uh, you, you have lost comment in the AST, uh, or if uh, you want to, for instance, uh, check uh, that you have a, uh, like a PEP8 checker, uh, almost you, you can do um, anything with an AST because you will want to will be interested in uh, like uh, line length or spaces around uh, around operators uh, things like that. So uh, you you have some time to fall back uh, in such case to text parsing. Uh, we do that in Pilot. Actually, in Pilot we have even three kind of checkers. One working on the AST using a visitor pattern. Uh, you may also uh, provide some checker which will work uh, at the token level using the tokenized module of a Python standard library or directly on the file uh, using a line stream. For instance, in case of uh, for the, the tokenized module, we recently wanted to add um, a check that, um, you know, if you are writing uh, if... Uh, else if another condition in some case you may want to rewrite it you you may be able to rewrite it using a single if elif elif con uh, construction you see what i mean mm -hmm. so uh, in the case of uh, abstract syntax tree uh, in uh, the python abstract syntax tree it already uh, if you have in your source code if uh, elif something you will have in the abstract syntax tree uh, if else with a, a child if else node in the in the else branch of the first if. You see, so mm -hmm. it's not if you if you just write it back uh, to Python, you won't get the exact same thing as uh, the one which you have been parsing. So uh, in this case. Uh, that, that's an example where we had to uh, take a look at the output of the tokenizer to see, uh, to distinguish between uh, if nodes which are actually if nodes or if not which have been introduced by the parser but which are actually uh, uh, elif part of a previous if. And uh, so that's an example uh, where we have to get back to tokenize. And uh, I think I've already mentioned cases where we have to go back to text parsing for like 
commons, spaces, uh, and almost everything which is in the PEP8. Yeah, I can definitely see where text parsing wouldn't, or where the AST wouldn't provide the full suite of information that you would need to do a proper analysis of Python code for code quality and sort of stylistic checks as well. So, yeah, you you even don't have, a, for instance, a parent which has used to which are used to balance uh, expression. Mm -hmm. So this is you may even you don't know uh, if uh, there are or there are not parent in the original source code. So without uh, extra information, you can't from the AST. You 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 are not able to reproduce the the ori original source code. That's where you will have to jump to other representation like pass three. Well, I have to say that having a greater understanding of the mechanisms that are going on under the covers when using PyLint, I'm very grateful for all of the hard work that you and everyone else has put into it to make my life easier for deter determining where I'm doing things wrong in my code. <laughs> Thanks. And so beyond static analysis, what are some of the other possible uses for the Python AST and the Asteroid library? Yes, uh, as I said, um... Uh, there is a guy you now early working on Asteroid, which intends to uh, make it a reference implementation of AST for Python, because uh, it, as I said, it's uh, it was uh, extracted from Pylint a long time ago uh, with the intent that it may be used by other projects, uh, but. Uh, as it was uh, mainly drive, uh, driven by pilot uh, needs, uh, the, the API wasn't uh, as clear as it should be. But I think it provides enough uh, nice features to be attractive. So this guy decided to make it clean and uh, make it at some point to 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 make it more powerful uh, and to use it for this uh, micro project you can also i don't know maybe uh, generate uh, documentation or uh, the ast is also used for um, the for instance doing things like 223 uh, like reading python 2 code and generating uh, python 3 code but uh, in this case, it's uh, it's used uh, it's using uh, it's not using the the same base uh, uh, implementation um, uh, as we are using uh, because we already say that you lose some information that you don't want to lose if you are transforming your source code from Python two to to Python three you. Maybe you won't be very happy if you lose all your comments um, and uh, formatting on the way. You can also maybe do some kind of uh, uh, code completion. Uh, we already talked about uh, using it in ID, uh, things like that. I have made some, uh, a long time ago, I have made a, a toy that was uh, allowing you to uh, display your source code in uh, HTML and then you could click on every variable and it was jumping to the place where it was defined in your source code. Uh, it was the kind of thing you may want to do. That sounds like a very interesting project. It's a dead project. It was only <laughs> it was uh, something I've done in uh, 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 in uh, Euro Python uh, uh, five uh, lightning talk. But uh, I uh, have not. Uh, I don't even know where the source code is now. Well, it's just another example of where whimsy in programming can be can lead to some pretty interesting outcomes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know that there are a few other projects I've come across recently that leverage the AST for to some pretty interesting effect, such as uh, a little while ago we interviewed the folks behind the high lang implementation of running a Lisp dialect on top of the Python VM. They said that they use the AST, and there's also the Pony ORM, which uses the AST to allow you to write 
SQL expressions using Python uh, list comprehensions and generator expressions. So the documentation for the AST package in Python mentions that the specific syntax objects in the tree are subject to change between releases, and I'm wondering if the Asteroid package provides any abstractions to maintain a consistent API between different Python versions, or does it just provide a pass-through for those syntax objects and adds the extra metadata around and convenience methods around the tree itself? Uh, yes, uh, uh, it does this kind of thing. Actually, uh, it always starts from the Python representation, so it, use, uh, it uses the Python parser, but uh, from this, uh, from the uh, AST, which is written by the Python parser, you've got uh, afterwards a rebuild step, uh, step sorry, that will um, uh, kind of um, normalize this Python tree, so it's it's compatible with uh, when there is some change across Python version. So you should you may expect to have always the same the, the same representation. That's uh, actually a, a basic need for tools like PyLint, where you don't want to, you want a single PyLint. You don't want to to handle every case uh, every case of uh, Python version. Also, it provides, for instance. Um, when a new a new release Python release introduces some new nodes because there are some new constructs uh, in the grammar, usually you may uh, import them from Asteroid uh, even if you are using a lower version. So that's a kind of consistent API, and uh, that doesn't mean we don't want to uh, make it make it moving, it evolves as all uh, API, but uh, we we are trying to do it in a proper way with uh, some kind of uh, deprecation for some time, like if you are using the old API, it will still work, but uh, with a deprecation warning, uh, which usually uh, explain uh, which new method or function or class you should use. So, because of course we uh, we don't have the same constraint as uh, Python, and uh, we that's a kind of service which is provided by uh, Asteroid. Have you encountered any challenges in testing Asteroid, given that it operates at such a low level in the language? Uh, well, not really in in testing. Uh, however, there are some tricky stuff in Asteroid because. Uh, um, a feature I forgot to mention was, is that uh, Asteroid provides um, um, <coughs> provides AST representation for uh, live, uh, for objects which uh, don't objects which don't have uh, source code like uh, built-ins or objects which are implemented in C extension or even uh, Python code where source code isn't distributed. So it's very useful. Like you, you may want to, in some case, for instance, in, in Pilot, we don't want to have special special way to understand uh, either uh, Python source code or uh, code which is coming from built-ins. Uh, we want to be able to handle them uh, uh, similarly, uh, and also it's very useful. It's almost a need if you want to do uh, some kind of static inference. You don't want two different representations. You have to share the very the same kind of representation. Whether uh, you see that uh, I don't know, you you have a, a list defined in your Python source code or whether you have some kind of uh, built-in function which return a list or things like that. So um, that's that's somewhat a bit tricky. For instance, you have to bootstrap the Asteroid uh, packages, the, the, the Asteroid representation using uh, by by uh, building some representation for everything that is in the built-in module in Python. Uh, you need to do that in a specific time uh, uh, because uh, 
it does some advanced stuff and for some when it's building an AST it will itself use the inf its own inference capabilities to uh, add some uh, information to this AST so uh, it's a bit tricky uh, to bootstrap the process I think that's the kind of thing which also make uh, makes a asteroid difference from uh, other projects so speaking of asteroid being different from other projects do you have trouble getting contributors given the great understanding of python's inner workings required maybe we have been working on pinint and asteroid without much uh, contributors for years but um, I think there's a, a fairly good um, ecosystem in Python. I don't know if you are uh, aware of the code quality mailing list, which is uh, about code quality in general in Python, of course, uh, and where you will find people which are involved in uh, PEP8, uh, Flake8, uh, Pylint, uh, and other, uh, and other tools like that. So you have some people uh, with uh, which are, uh, I think, uh, um, advanced Python user and quite uh, good uh, computer scientist. So we there, there are not a lot of people, but that's uh, pretty good people. And uh, we currently have uh, uh, maybe. Um, Three people working in uh, on Asteroid or Pilot, but if you take a look at the Bitbucket projects, since uh, both are hosted uh, at Bitbucket for now, you will see that it's very very active. Um, so I can't say that uh, it's a trouble. And so does the implementation or representation of the AST differ between different distributions of Python, such as CPython, PyPy, and Jython? No, uh, this is, uh, the AST is, uh, is representing the Python language, and it should be, so there is different version of the language, but that's the, the, like Python 2 or Python 3, or maybe you've got different constructs in uh, Python 2.5 uh, and Python uh, 3.2. Provided that you are comparing CPython uh, 2.7 and PyPy 2.7, it should be the same AST, and Asteroid should be able to uh, work uh, with uh, any Python implementation. I guess that's another benefit of having such a well-specified language definition as opposed to some of the other languages that have alternate implementations, such as Ruby. Yes, indeed. So what are some of the most interesting applications Asteroid has been used in? As I said, uh, uh, Asteroid has been designed to be used in our project, but uh, uh, until now it was kind of fade, probably because of various uh, reasons, like uh, I mentioned, like maybe there was a bit of technical debt. Um, it, the API uh, has grown and uh, needed to be refreshed. Uh, and also there are a few projects that really need this kind of uh, thing. So, um, Pilot is definitely the, the EV user in the place. I think that it will probably change in the near future like, uh, because there is a uh, EV lifting, uh, which is uh, being done currently by uh, contributors. So I hope the best is uh, still to come. So before we move to the picks, are there any questions that we didn't ask that you think we should have or anything that you would like to add? Uh, no, that's fine by me. Okay. All right. So I guess with that, we will move to the picks. And for my first pick today, I'm going to choose the pre-commit framework by the folks at Yelp. I just added this to my projects at work, and it's a library or framework that lets you easily add and specify pre-commit hooks to run on your on your project, and it supports multiple languages. So built in, they have the ability to do 
hooks that are written with Python, Ruby, Node, as well as general scripts or system binaries. So I actually just added a pull request to it recently for being able to specify additional dependencies so that you don't have to go and rewrite a module for it just to add some extra plugins, like most specifically in my case was for ESLint. So definitely pretty useful. I recommend checking it out so that you can add some pre-commit checks for doing static analysis and executing your tests before you actually push it up to your repos. For my next pick, I'm going to pick an online comic called Existential Comics. And these are all pretty funny treatments of different schools of philosophy. And so the one most recently is a comic of various philosophers taking part in the storyline of Monty Python's Holy Grail. So I can't even begin to do it justice by explanation, so I recommend you just go check it out. And my last pick is a project I came across recently called HTML Pi, which seems to be taking a page out of the playbook of the different uh, node-based desktop apps that have been coming out recently that are leveraging web technologies for making it easy for different people to create desktop GUI apps. And so this is an application that lets you use HTML5 and CSS3 for defining some of the UI of your program, and then it uses PyQt under the covers to provide the frame as well as being able to provide uh, backend logic in Python. So pretty interesting, and I'm definitely happy to see that as a new entrant into the Python GUI ecosystem and as a way to help move forward desktop applications beyond what we currently have available and to maybe bring in some people from the web community to provide beautiful looking UIs to Python programs. And with that, I will pass it to you, Chris. Very cool. I'm going to keep my picks relatively short this week because I I have a hard stop, but um, I have two. Uh, the first is a beer. It is the Pretty Things brewery fluffy white rabbits <laughs> uh it is a really great triple with a fluffy mouth feel as they say which i know sounds kind of strange but it's true and a really nice fruity character and pretty things is ceasing production so boston area beer fans are sad uh <laughs> and my next pick is a game if you're a gamer you've already heard about this but oh my god Fallout 4 is is really impressive. As a it, since it's set in the Boston area, as a longtime Bostonian, I am kind of blown away, even by things like the detail of the trees and the grass. It looks like trees and grass look like here, which I realize is a small thing, but it's kind of it makes the whole experience even more surreal. Like you're actually wandering around in an area that you know well. Uh, great stuff, uh, Sylvain. What do you have for us for picks? Um, I have um, two picks, which are many things I have also uh, worked on. Uh, my first one would be um, Pi Reverse. It may be good to know that this tool is um, distributed with PyLint, and it's a nice thing to do some quick reverse engineering, like you just start Pi, Pi Reverse on your project, and it will be able to produce a class, dra class diagram or package uh, diagram um, from for the whole project, or you can say, uh, give me a diagram for this class uh, with uh, maybe all the classes which are related uh, to jumps uh, around and things like that. So it's pretty nice, and uh, I think it's a, a good way to stop maybe doing too much uh, UML diagram when uh, in a specification phase, uh, just write your Python code and get the diagram afterwards. So that uh, was my first pick. The other is um, uh, another project uh, on which I have been very involved uh, and which is mainly developed at Logilab is the Cubic Web web framework, so that's um, uh, a, uh, a web framework for Python, uh, which is quite uh, at a higher level than Django or Pyramid or Flask or usual uh, Python web framework. Uh, and it's heavily 
uh, relying on the principle of a semantic web, like every object there has a URL and uh, it attempts to write some to to expose your data uh, using uh, known vocabulary such as "fof" or uh, anything. So you you just start up with a, a, sh a schema. Uh, you've got a working application, and again, you can uh, uh, put some data there and apply some view to your to your data. So it's a different uh, way to to build your web application, which is uh, uh, very um, incremental. So so you can uh, build uh, application very with uh, a lot of uh, agility and. Uh, I think it may, uh, it deserves a look. Okay, so I really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to join us today to talk about Asteroid and some Pilot. And for anybody who wants to keep in touch with you and follow what you're up to, what would be the best way for them to do that? Well, uh, you can, for uh, people which are interested in Asteroid or in Pilot, uh, I highly recommend to uh, register to the code quality mailing list. Uh, there is also the Pilot dev mailing list for people who, which are more interested in contributing or with a more technical question. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, uh, C-T-E-N-O, uh, S-Y-T-H-E-N-A-U-L-T. My name is a bit complicated. And of course, you can follow uh, our work at Logilab on our logilab.org website or cubicweb.org uh, website or Twitter at Logilab. Excellent. Well, thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for receiving me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.